Arthur fiend! Surrender now, or I'll show you my... SPECIAL ATTACK! Toby Fox's Undertale was more than a hit indie game. When it released in 2015, it became a gaming cultural touchstone. But as the years went on, opinions on the game started to sour until it seemed like there were more dissenters than actual fans. That isn't a particularly new concept in the industry, but what makes Undertale's story unique is the people behind its downfall. Rather than a greedy publisher or a misguided creative mind, Undertale's ultimate undoing would come at the hands of the people who loved it most, its fans. Beginning as a humble $5,000 Kickstarter campaign by Homestuck composer and Earthbound ROM hacker Toby Fox, Undertale quickly snowballed into not only one of the most popular games of all time, but one of the internet's most prolific and pervasive fandoms. If you were on the internet in 2015 and 2016, Undertale was unavoidable. Gaming news publications couldn't stop talking about it, YouTubers were putting out multi-part playthroughs and revealing the coolest in-game secrets, memes were being made at lightning speed and spread across every internet forum imaginable. And as the buzz got louder and harder to ignore, more people started to call themselves fans of Undertale. In just a couple of years, the Undertale fandom would rival and even surpass that of pre-established gaming and non-gaming franchises. The Sonics and the Super Hulocks of the world were quaking with the arrival of this new powerhouse that had suddenly appeared on the scene. But because Undertale was only one game, and a fairly short one at that, people had to start getting creative pretty quickly with their fan content. The traditional fan art, fan fiction, and fan theories that a normal franchise is subjected to was not enough for Undertale. Multiple alternate universes popped up online, imagining the in-game characters with swapped personalities or in a different world or in different relationships. And because this is the internet, many fandoms formed around these alternate universes. More fan works were created just for the alternate universes, including fully playable fan games. And then those alternate universes were combined into a still ongoing animated web series with tens of millions of views made. But as much as people loved the AUs, nothing could beat the adoration the fandom had for the original game. The most popular Undertale video on YouTube is a fan animated rap performed by two of the game's characters with 130 million views. That's an inconceivable achievement for an indie game that only needed $5,000 to get off the ground. Now, you'll notice that so far we've spent very little time talking about what Undertale actually is, what type of game it is, what its story is like, who the main characters are. We haven't touched on any of it, and that's deliberate. Sure, the story about doing good even when it's difficult and being aware of how your actions affect the people you care about was pretty impactful. Combat was done with a level of personality we hadn't really seen before, and the characters were distinct and memorable. But none of that is part of Undertale's legacy. Not anymore. Undertale, for better and worse, has really been defined by its fans. They were the ones who propelled the game into major stardom kept its name in the public eye, and extended the life of the IP with brilliant fan creations. But while there is a magic to the symbiotic relationship between games and their fans, Undertale grew too fast and too unstable, so the cracks started to show very early. The fanbase was ravenous. They were so complete in their consumption of the game and creation of content that they found themselves bereft of new material in no time. There were no more secrets left to uncover, no in-game choice left unmade, no thoughtful theories left to craft, and no character left behind in the piles of fan fictions, animations, and art. I'll get you, human, no matter how much spaghetti it takes. Oh, this is good. Like vultures picking a carcass clean until only the bones remain, the Undertale fandom had stripped the game of substance. And from there, the whole thing started to collapse in on itself. Undertale was no longer a video game. Rather, it was a multimedia franchise that belonged not to Toby Fox, but to the internet. For a not insignificant amount of people, their introduction to Undertale was through fan-made material rather than the game itself. Let's remember that tens of millions of people watched some of these Undertale fan animations, and an unknowable number of eyes were reached by Undertale fanfiction. But among all the incredible work done by supremely talented artists, writers, animators, musicians, and game developers, there was a not-so-secret sub-community full of, but let's just say morally and legally objectionable content. It's not hard to imagine why potential Undertale players may shy away from a game when the first thing they come into contact with is a fan artist who ships two biological brothers together, or ships adult characters with the child protagonist. 
This is unfortunately not uncommon behavior in fan spaces, but with Undertale's Wild West type boom in popularity, the more abhorrent aspects of fandom were able to gain traction much quicker and much more visibly than they may have otherwise. But even those who were participating in innocent celebrations of their favorite game weren't safe. Since the game had resonated so deeply with tons of people, many felt it was their sworn duty to protect their favorite characters and indeed the game itself from being mistreated. This resulted in some of the most ferocious gatekeeping in gaming fandom history. Not only were people sensitive about how canon characters were used in fan works, but they were very quick to judge anyone who didn't play the game exactly as they did. Specifically, those who did not execute a flawless pacifist run were deemed to be as bad as real life murderers. The most highly publicized example of this specific phenomenon was Markiplier's Undertale playthrough from 2015, which only got two episodes before Mark shut it down. In a later statement, he would tell his audience that the reason he stopped was, Everyone was disappointed in the way I was playing it. It was so pervasive that it made the entire experience not fun for me. His fans berated him for the voices he gave the characters, his decision to kill monsters, and his general lack of veneration for the game much like they had done to other players on a smaller scale all over the internet. And just like Mark, many of those players likely stopped playing Undertale for fear of stirring up more vitriol. They lost all enthusiasm for what could have been a great experience. This strict code of how the game needs to be played and how characters need to be portrayed is what would ultimately lead to the death of Undertale. Because these were not the actions of an easily dismissible sub-community, this was the majority of the fan base hunting down anyone who even considered playing Undertale in order to bully them into making the choices they had collectively deemed to be the right ones. Otherwise, in the eyes of the fandom, they were doing it wrong and they were hurting the beloved Undertale characters. Not only does this attitude go against everything the interactive player-centered medium of video games stands for, but it's actively in contrast to the lessons that people were supposed to learn from Undertale. Kindness, compassion, and an understanding that bad choices don't inherently make you a bad person. There's no overstating how intense and widespread this way of thinking was. It got so bad that Toby Fox had to dedicate a large section of the FAQ for his next project, Deltarune, to assuring players that it had nothing to do with Undertale canon and wouldn't affect the choices they made in that game. It's actually kind of sad to read. If you completed Undertale, the ending and world are as you left it. If everyone was happy there, the people in the Undertale world will still be happy. So please don't worry about those characters and that world. It will remain untouched. It's as if Toby is literally pleading with fans to take a step back and look at the actual project at hand rather than a game he made several years ago. But when a fandom gets as bloated and irritated as Undertale's, there's no way to talk them down. And so instead of engaging, more and more people have started to shy away from the game and its fans entirely. This mixed with the overwhelming avalanche of content the fandom found itself buried in led to dwindling interest. Today, the Undertale fandom is a shell of what it used to be. There are still diehard fans and there always will be, but the golden age is long gone. Just as they had picked Undertale's bones clean, the fans cannibalized themselves until there was hardly anything left. And because of that, a little indie game went from one of gaming's crowning achievements to something a lot of us would prefer to forget. But it's not all bad. Despite the crushing weight of Undertale, Toby Fox is still creating. Deltarune, while not finished, is shaping up to be a pretty great game. Toby's dedication to his craft in the face of all that fame and complicated fandom drama is inspiring. And if you're anything like us, it fills you with determination. And that's all there is for today's video. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. If you liked what you saw, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe to Nerdstalgia Gaming so you don't miss our weekly videos. In the meantime, let us know down below. Were you an Undertale fan in 2015? Are you an Undertale fan now?